hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute's ongoing online series of lectures. Uh, today, I'm particularly gratified to welcome David Satter as today's speaker. David is a leading commentator on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He's the author of five books on Russia and the creator, and the Soviet Union, I should say, and the creator of a documentary film on the fall of the USSR. His most recent book is Never Speak to Strangers and Other Writings from Russia and the Soviet Union, an anthology of his writing from 1976 to 2000. 19 was published this year. David is a former Moscow correspondent, and he's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, David graduated from the University of Chicago and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He worked for four years as a police reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and in 1976 was named Moscow Correspondent of the London Financial Times. He worked in Moscow for six years from 1976 to 1982, during which time he sought out Soviet citizens with the intention of preserving their accounts of the Soviet totalitarian system for posterity. After completing his term in Moscow, Mr. Satter became a special correspondent on Soviet affairs for the Wall Street Journal. In 1990, he was named a Thornton Hooper Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia, and then a senior fellow at that institute. From 2003 to 2008, he was a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. David teaches a course on contemporary Russian history at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced Academic Programs. Mr. Satter's other books about Russia include Russia, It Was a Long Time Ago and It Never Happened Anyway, Russia and the Communist Past, Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, and Darkness at Dawn the rise of the Russian criminal state. His books have been translated into Russian, Estonian, Latvian, Czech, Portuguese, and Vietnamese. It's his first book, Age of Delirium, that was made into a documentary film. Mr. Satters testified frequently on Russian affairs before congressional committees. His articles and op-ed pieces have appeared in all the major newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the National Interest, National Review, the New York Republic, the New York Sun, the New York Review of Books, and many others. He is frequently interviewed in both Russian and English by Radio Liberty, the Voice of America, and the BBC Russian Service, and many others. Uh, today, David's going to speak to us on the nature of Vladimir Putin's regime and the reasons for its foreign policy. Welcome, David. Bob, thanks very much. I'm very, very glad to be here and uh, very glad to talk about a subject that's often not very well understood, which is Russian foreign policy, and especially the sources of Russian foreign policy. We talk a lot about Russia and what it does in the world, but much of the discussion is uh, distorted by the fact that we're assuming that Russia acts on the same general assumptions and with the same general goals as other countries. It's not the case. Uh, Russia it has always been motivated by uh, factors that uh, are outside the typical Western frame of reference when it comes to making foreign policy decisions. And this dates back actually to the Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union uh, was, mo was, was, was animated by its ideology. And although that ideology appeared absurd when viewed from the outside, it was the most potent factor in organizing the society and directing its actions toward the outside world. 
When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, our immediate reaction in the West was to assume that this was the first step in an attempt to uh, seize the Persian Gulf, or at least advance uh, uh, the Soviet Union to uh, the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. But in fact, the invasion of Afghanistan was motivated by completely different factors. Uh, Soviet ideology held that a communist regime, once it was established, could not be displaced. It could never be overthrown. And this was not a matter of politics. This was a matter, according to the ideology that was inculcated in people's minds for, for, for decades, this was a matter of science. Lenin himself said that the ideology is irrefutable, uh, Marxist ideology is as irrefutable as the axioms of geometry. So for a country on uh, Russia's borders uh, to witness the overthrow of a communist regime, once that regime had taken power, would have been destabilizing for the Soviet Union itself. There's evidence that the Soviet leaders, in fact, uh, were unaware that the Afghan communists were plotting to take power and their seizure of power in the country uh, in uh, 1978 took, took the Soviet leadership by surprise. But once they were in power, once they were aligned with the Soviet Union, once they were identified as communists, uh, there was no longer a question in the eyes of the Soviet rulers of uh, allowing the Afghan people to overthrow what was really very much a foreign implant uh, and a, a regime that was contrary to the traditions uh, of what at one time was a relatively peaceful country. So we misinterpreted, we began a tremendous buildup at the time in the Persian Gulf and in the Middle East. In fact, our our, our, our major commitment in the Middle East, that part of the world, dates back from a misreading of what happened in the Soviet Union uh, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, and we continued to misread the situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union uh, throughout uh, the final years of the Soviet Union, during which time uh, we neglected the fact that the Soviet Union was not interested in building an empire per se. It was interested in turning its fictitious ideology into reality. And the only way to do that was by force. So I, when the Soviet Union fell, the ideology uh, disappeared with it. The Soviet Union existed, was not a normal country. Russia is a traditional country. Ukraine is a traditional country. Armenia is a traditional country. Georgia is a traditional country. The Soviet Union is a collection of traditional countries organized to realize an ideology. And without the Soviet Union, the ideology could not any longer be the motivating factor in the actions of the countries that at one time were part of the Soviet Union. Okay. With the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the, the countries that, that emerged from the wreckage of what was in fact an ideological empire had to find uh, new sources of motivation for their foreign policy. And insofar as what happened in Russia, and we'll get to this uh, in a moment, was a criminal takeover of the country by a small group. Uh, Russian foreign policy uh, again began to be motivated by, by the power considerations of a very restricted elite, no longer for ideological reasons, but rather in order to keep that small group, I don't like to use the word elite because there's nothing el elite about them, uh, but the, this small group which monopolized property and monopolized power to keep them uh, in control uh, basically forever. And we've seen that and we do see it 
uh, we saw it recently with the vote in, in Russia, to remove any, the last constitutional limits on Putin remaining in power indefinitely, although he was always intending to remain president for life. Under these circumstances, uh, Russia makes war for internal reasons. It does so in order to distract the uh, population from the way in which they are misruled. The first Chechen war, which began at the end of 1994, actually in December 94, and, and there was a decisive battle on New Year's Day, or uh, actually on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, in Grozny was undertaken in the words of Oleg Lobov, who was the head of the Security Council under Yeltsin, uh, in order to boost the rating of President Yeltsin. He said, we need a short, victorious war in order to boost the president's rating. This is the same formula that was used to describe the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905, which in fact uh, was decisive in setting Russia on the path to, to the Russian Revolution. Uh, the war was neither short nor, vict nor victorious, uh, and it didn't seem to occur to anyone at the time that this was an unacceptable reason for starting a war. But nonetheless, uh, this was uh, the explanation given by Lobov, and all evidence supports uh, the uh, idea that, that the war was motivated basically to shore up Yeltsin's political position. The first Chechen war was followed by the second Chechen war, which was uh, necessary in order to put Putin in power. Second Chechen war was followed by uh, the intervention, the, the seizure of Crimea and the intervention uh, in Eastern Ukraine, which was necessary in order to distract Russians from the true meaning of the Maidan revolt in Ukraine. And the war in Syria was launched in order to distract Russians from the failure of the intervention in Ukraine. In every case, people were killed. Devastation was inflicted on innocent populations in order uh, to protect uh, those, the, the small group of people in Russia who monopolize property and power. Well, how did all of this come about? Uh, in fact, it's the product of a long evolution and a very tragic evolution, but something that's frequently seen in human history. Uh, Russia emerged from the Soviet dictatorship with a great opportunity, the possibility of becoming really a respected and prosperous member of the international community. And that, and that possibility was lost uh, because Russia proceeded on the basis of false ideas. And those ideas Uncon were unconsciously inherited from the communist past. There's a, one of the fundamental principles of the communist ideology is the notion of economic determinism. The idea that the base of society is also always determined by the nature of economic relations and those relations dictate everything else. Uh, they, they dictate the laws, the culture, uh, the, the education, the mentality, and psychology. Uh, this was taken for granted by the uh, Soviet regime, which assumed that uh, a country run by the working class would be automatically just. And uh, Marxist theory was turned on its head by the young reformers in the Russian period, in the post-Soviet period, who assumed that all that was necessary was to put property into the hands of private owners. And uh, a democracy and rule by law 
would automatically result. In both cases, what was missing was an appreciation of the importance of the rule of law, of a moral framework, of the authority of transcendent values. So in the true sense, there was, there was a revolution when the Soviet Union was overthrown in terms of uh, the economic system. One economic system was replaced with another. But in terms of the mentality of people, in terms of the moral, uh, uh, the moral framework of society, things remained absolutely the, the same. Uh, anything that the authorities did was considered to be justified. Uh, the uh, justification for any act, uh, no matter how barbaric, was considered to be the economic system. And uh, the attitude toward crime was uh, absolutely casual because the criminals were seen as socially friendly. They were on the side of the new emerging capitalism, just as they had been on the side of the authorities uh, in their terrorizing of the political prisoners uh, under the Soviet regime. Country without law, undergoing a massive economic transition from socialism to capitalism, uh, could not have any other fate uh, than complete criminalization. Uh, too much money was at stake. Uh, it was too easy. Uh, simply to grab what already existed. And the most cr clever predators rose to the top uh, under, this, under these conditions. Uh, Yeltsin uh, was the creature of these criminal groups. And he had no intention uh, to share power. Uh, in 1993, uh, the last remnant, really, of democratic rule in Russia was destroyed when Yeltsin unilaterally, ignoring the law, abolished the parliament. And then uh, engaged in a massacre uh, at the Estancano television tower in which dozens of innocent people were mowed down. And then at the uh, White House the next day, using tanks to shell the parliament building uh, in order to establish a new political system in Russia in which there was no challenge to executive power. And there was no challenge also to the illegal accumulation of money. Well, Privatization proceeded. The former socialist economy was put into private hands. It was the greatest uh, transfer, peaceful transfer of property in human history. And it proceeded at breakneck speed. Anyone who had corrupt connections to the authorities could become, could be basically appointed a millionaire. And, uh, property that had been created uh, by the, through the collective efforts of the entire population was handed out to criminal gangs, to businessmen with uh, corrupt connections to officials, uh, to those uh, who uh, uh, had, a, had, had, had worked in the economy previously and were adept at, at uh, taking over what had originally been given uh, to the workforce as a whole. Uh, and uh, a ruling group was created in Russia that was uh, composed almost in equal parts of organized crime, corrupt officials, and uh, 
and corrupted former factory directors. And this group uh, you know, began to experience phenomenal, uh, phenomenal wealth as was reflected in their ostentatious spending. Under the Soviet regime, uh, there were in inequalities, but they were hidden. Uh, under the post-Soviet regime, inequality and difference in wealth, ostentatious consumption, became the, one of the most defining features of the urban landscape. Uh, at the same time, uh, the economy collapsed. Uh, World War II veterans were driven into the street to sell their belongings. Uh, beggars appeared everywhere. Uh, the number of unsupervised children abandoned by their parents uh, reached unprecedented levels. Uh, they lived under railroad bridges, uh, uh, at stations, uh, uh, um, begging and, and, and suffering from, from and, and committing crimes. Uh, the prostitution became uh, in, inescapable because no one, no one it, it began to be taken for granted that the street, the big streets in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and Moscow was Gorky Street, and St. Petersburg it was Nevsky Prospect, would be lined at night with women selling themselves. Uh, under these conditions, uh, there was a psychological crisis that was experienced by millions of Russian people. Uh, it's no justification of the communist regime to say that for millions of Russian people, communism defined their, the framework of their lives. The values of communism, the, the, the mythology of communism, uh, the, they were inculcated in people, generation after generation. Uh, these values, of course, because they uh, did not allow for any kind of uh, religious or transcendent point of moral reference, uh, were incapable of creating a moral society. But at the same time, they did propagate certain practices that were not all bad. Russians were encouraged to care for each other, to look out for each other. And to a certain extent, this, this ethos was assimilated. With the fall of the Soviet Union, it was important that that communist constellation of values and practices be replaced by a new set of values, a, a new mentality based on genuine universal values and genuine fair play. What, for, what Russian former communist citizens saw, on the contrary, was that the country was taken over by obvious criminals. Uh, in the eight years that Yeltsin was in power, uh, the death rate uh, in, in Russia achieved unprecedented levels. Democ demographers looking at the rate of mortality in Russia beginning in 92, 93, could not believe that so many people were dying under, under peacetime conditions. They died from accidents. They died from illness. They died from suicide. They died from despair. Uh, many Russians trained to rigidity and obedience could not adapt to the new situation. And uh, given the fact that, there, that, that the new uh, leadership did not consider seriously the importance of any type of social protection in a transitional period. They felt abandoned and, and helpless. Uh, Yeltsin himself said, and in this respect he was true, he said that uh, we jumped into the water without knowing how to swim. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's, it's emphasis, it is, estimated that 
the number of surplus deaths in Russia in the 1990s was about 6 million people. Surplus deaths, that's a term that's used by demographers. It refers to deaths that could not have been anticipated by previous conditions, by a projection based on previous conditions. Russia's uh, uh, population and the longevity, and male, especially male longevity, uh, 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 were were reduced uh, uh, to a to a degree that had not been seen in the 20th century in any other industrial country except under conditions of war. Uh, at the same time, the hardship for ordinary people was simply uh, uh, unbelievable. I got a a sample of this when I went to Vladivostok. There was one incident that stuck in my mind. Uh, people were uh, fishing on the ice uh, in the in in the bay uh, outside the city, and the police continually were chasing them off the ice because the ice was breaking and there was one drowning after another. Uh, there was one particularly bad incident in which uh, the ice broke and a whole group of people drowned. And the next day the police were out there and uh, chasing, uh, again, fishermen who were out on the, on the same dangerous ice. And uh, one old man, absolutely refused to leave. Uh, finally, uh, the, the police went out and got him, uh, taking a risk themselves. And afterwards, he was asked why he hadn't listened when the police told him to abandon uh, uh, you know, his post. And didn't he, did he not realize that he was risking his life. And his answer was something I'll never forget. He said, I, I'd rather die than live like this. Um, and that was, not, uh, that was not an aberration. Uh, at the largest graveyard outside of Moscow, where a whole tract of land had been set aside for fresh graves, the grave digger told a journalist, he said, you see these graves, they're all young people. We never had it like this before. Under these conditions, needless to say, Yeltsin's popularity uh, with the population collapsed. And no amount of, of, of sh no number of short victorious wars or other stunts were capable of restoring it. 1999, Yeltsin's uh, popularity rating was 2%. Now, those pollsters will, will attest that in almost any survey, 6% of the respondents don't understand the question. So that will give you an idea of just how hated Yeltsin was at that point in time. Uh, it was considered to be impossible for Yeltsin or for anyone he supported to be elected the new Russian president. But then at that point, rumors began to circulate that something big was going to happen. There was going to be some type of provocation that would make it possible for Yeltsin to declare martial law. I was in Moscow at the time, and there were the rumors were there were conflicting rumors. One rumor was that um, there was going to be a war between criminal gangs unleashed in the center of Moscow. The other was that a famous celebrities were going to be kidnapped and tortured publicly and then killed. And another was that government buildings were going to be blown up. And a short time after that, uh, buildings were blown up, but they weren't government buildings. They were the buildings of ordinary, in which ordinary people were living. This is the most important event in 20, 21st century. Well, it wasn't 21st century. It was the end of the 20th century. But in any case, in recent Russian history, uh, the bombing of the apartment buildings. Uh, first in the city of Winoksk, uh, 
in the Caucasus, then in Moscow, then in the city of Volgodonsk. Apartment buildings were blown up in the middle of the night for maximum casualties. The Chechens were accused of being responsible. A new war was initiated in Chechnya that Russians had been opposed to a new invasion because the previous invasion had been in unsuccessful. The new invasion was launched after initial successes based on the use, of, the indiscriminate use of, of banned weapons uh, including cluster bombs on, on civilian areas. Uh, uh, the popularity of, of Yeltsin's designated successor, Vladimir Putin, a person who had been the head of the KGB and had been virtually unknown, began to rise. On September 8th, Yeltsin, in a conversation with Bill Clinton, said that uh, Vladimir Putin is going to be the new president. Uh, you'll be able to work with him. He'll be a good partner for the United States. There was a question, how Yel first of all, the very idea that Yeltsin could determine in advance the new president showed you the mentality uh, and the respect for democracy. But second of all, it was somewhat mysterious how a person with a popularity rating of 2% could be so sure that he had the power to designate his successor. But on September 9th, the next day, the building on the apartment building on Guryanova Street in Moscow blew up in the middle of the night. Uh, from that point on, uh, the scenario played itself out perfectly. Uh, Russians all over the country were terrorized and afraid of going to sleep at night. Uh, Putin, the newly designated prime minister, vowed that he would pursue the terrorists wherever he could find them, even in their outhouses, and kill them. Uh, uh, a, ma a massive invasion was mounted, and, uh, and Putin was transformed from you know, an anonymous stooge of, of Yeltsin into the savior of the country. Uh, and he was, elect, he was elected president. Now, all of this would have worked perfectly had it not been for one hitch, which is a fifth bomb was placed in a building in the city of Riazan. And that city and that bomb was discovered in time by watchful residents and deactivated. And three people were arrested in Riazan because the whole city was cordoned off. And they, they turned out to be not Chechen terrorists. They turned out to be agents of the FSB. Uh, our government made a decision not to raise this issue. I know this from uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, inquiries that produced documents that showed they were informed that there was something deeply suspicious about uh, those bombings and, and that the Riazan incident was capable of, of, of basically over, you know, creating a, cri a massive crisis in the country in the interest of the truth, of course, if it was revealed. But in any case, uh, 300 people were killed. Yeltsin, uh, Putin's power was firmly established. And uh, the present regime uh, embarked on, uh, on self-enrichment and a program of assuring that it would never lose power. Uh, the ruling group in Russia became former KGB agents and, and cronies of Putin's. Uh, the methods that they used throughout the, throughout the 2000s uh, were, and the 2010s were terrorist methods, beginning with the uh, siege of the uh, Dubrovka theater, uh, the Beslan school massacre, the assassinations of Anna Politkovskaya, the leading investigative reporter 
Alexander Litvinenko, who was poisoned with a nuclear isotope in London, Boris Nemtsov, the opposition leader. Uh, the um, shooting down of the Malaysian airliner in 2014. Uh, all of this was intended to consolidate the, the, the power of this group that, that uh, exceeded to the presidency, exceeded to, to, to total authority uh, as a result of a terrorist act that the FBI, FSB and, uh, carried out against their own people. What makes it positively blood chilling is not the fact that they killed political opponents. Uh, a lot of people do that, uh, which, but they killed people at random. They just, they were ready to you know, just blow up a building in a working class area. Uh, and uh, uh, all for political, all for political goals. Under these circumstances, uh, n nothing that Russia does today in foreign policy is really surprising. The um, Soviet Union wanted to act out its ideology. In acting out its ideology, it assured that the group, which was the supposed uh, um, who consisted of the supposed guarantors or the uh, protectors or the interpreters of that ideology would be permanently in power. In post-Soviet in post-Soviet Russia, the, the the animating factor is to protect uh, the, this 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 corrupt and otherwise totally undistinguished group that it was able to seize power because of. Uh, of their willingness in the first instance to protect Yeltsin and his family, and in the second instance, their determination to protect themselves. Now, we in the U.S. have been have been really convulsed with various Russian Russia-related scandals. Uh, we are absolutely outraged that Russia would try to interfere in the U.S. election. Uh, and there's a good likelihood that they did interfere in the U.S. election. That would be very typical of them to do that. Uh, they are not really able to influence a U.S. election uh, very much. Uh, they don't say anything that hasn't that isn't said uh, more often, more forcefully, uh, and uh, and actually better by uh, the American political opponents themselves. What they're able to do is to, to do something that the, the, the KGB was expert at doing when it was fighting the dissidents in the Soviet period. They're, ab they're capable of turning people against each other. They're able of, to create chaos in American society. The, 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 the most dangerous accusation against the dissident was that he, he was really a KGB agent. And with that in mind, the KGB tried to infiltrate the dissident milieu. They did have their agents and provocateurs. Uh, the standard Russian Soviet technique of, for discrediting somebody is to try to create the impression that they work for, the, you know, for Russian intelligence that they're a, you know, an asset, that they're uh, in some way serving the interests of the Kremlin. And this is what happened in the, in the uh, uh, 2016 election with the Steele dossier. Uh, it was not that the dossier was, to, was convincing. It wasn't. Anyone with real knowledge would have read immediate, seen immediately that it was a FSB fake. But for those who are already at each other's throats, it was brilliant in this, it, it, it was able, it could be used as an attack weapon inside 
the American political competition. And with the Russians basically doing very little, uh, all they had to do was they, they understood that, they, that, that one side was hungry for a dossier of this type. They provided it. Uh, they didn't have to do much. Uh, you know, the, 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 the opposing sides did everything themselves. And for two and a half years, of course, we were uh, uh, transfixed with, you know, phony stories, um, you know, anonymous sources, uh, um, an, a, a, a fraudulent investigation that should have never taken place, uh, and Russian crimes in the meantime were completely ignored. Uh, serious issues affecting the United States and Russia, such as the murder of the opposition leader, Boris Nemtsov, the shooting down deliberately of a civilian airliner, on which, by the way, there was an American passenger, uh, the, uh, now, the, 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 the assassination of opponents of the regime abroad, uh, you know, the, 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 the use of, of, chem, of, of chemical weapons as murder wep as, as instruments of murder, for example, in the Skripal case, uh, these are the real issues in U.S. Russian relations. This is what, but, but this is what affects the stability of the regime. This is what uh, those who rule Russia would like us to ignore. And they have tried and true methods of getting us to ignore what they do. And one of the most important is to make sure that we're uh, fixated on, 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 uh, you know, on, on our in internal animosities, which revolve around issues which are of r no real importance. Uh, the Russians act similarly in the case of Ukraine. Uh, the Maidan revolt was a fundamental challenge, not just uh, to, the, to the rulers uh, in Ukraine, but also uh, uh, to the Putin regime. I mean, the Putin regime controls all the, all the principal levers of power in Russia. It can be, it can, but it can still be threatened uh, by a massive uh, revolt, a massive spontaneous self-organizing revolt, such as what took place in Ukraine, where you had hundreds of thousands of people in the street. Under those conditions, the instruments of repression are no longer reliable. There's no guarantee that you can order troops and police to open fire on civilians when you when their numbers reach reach that level uh and the russian authorities n know that and their first uh just as they they sought to distract americans they they they, they sought to distract their own people people uh with the invasion of ukraine uh Nothing could have been better calculated uh, to uh, play to nationalist instincts in the country than an invasion which was supposedly taking place in order to protect the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine, which in reality was not in any danger. And uh, similarly, in, in, in Syria, uh, the Russian leadership uh, is acting not in the, so much in the pursuit of a specific goals, but rather, uh, and, and certainly not ge re specific geopolitical goals, but rather in order to, to strengthen its hold over its own population. Uh, Russia is... Uh, half of the Soviet Union in terms of its economy, in terms of its population. The, it is not 
in a position to become a world power, nor does it have any ideology that it's seeking to propagate. Uh, its interest in having a presence in the uh, Middle East is a tribute to its vanity and to the idea that the, on the part of, of, of many Russian people that Russia should be a great power. When the Soviet Union fell, a void was created in many people's lives. It's important to bear in mind, I mean, I can describe it, an, an incident that took place when I was in the Soviet Union. I was standing in line at a store, actually waiting for potatoes, and a, a man in the long queue began shouting, how can, long can we wait in these lines? How could, long can this go on? Uh, and a woman started shouting back at him, never you mind, the whole world is afraid of us. And this reflected very much the attitude uh, uh, in Russia, the idea that we should make people afraid. Yes, we don't live very well. Our lives are miserable. People in the West, they probably live better, but we are part of a great state and we determine what goes on in the world. Uh, this compensatory mechanism was very effective. And when the Soviet Union fell and Russia suddenly was an indigent and, and, uh, and largely impotent power, uh, it, it, it created a psychological vacuum that any nationalist would ultimately be able to fill. I mean, to a certain extent, of course, there was, you know, the, some of the same mechanism played itself out during the Weimar Republic in Germany. Putin has it, understood this, and he understood the first thing he had to do uh, when uh, to prevent Russians from imitating what happened in Ukraine, or at least taking it as an example of how they could liberate themselves. Uh, he understood that distracting them with a, with a successful war in Ukraine uh, and an excess, a successful annexation would be all that he'd have to need to change the subject and boost his own personal popularity. And so that's what happened. Well, under these conditions in which we have a small criminal group in power in Russia, which organizes the foreign policy of a great country in, in strictly in its own interests and is willing to sacrifice the lives of their own people and other people in the, in, in, in the pursuit of the strengthening of their, of, of their corrupt power. Um, how ought we to deal with them? And what should we respect, what should we expect? The, um, we have had, I mean, a very um, controversial and in some respects uneven uh, experience with President Trump, who is a, uh, by all measures, uh, an unconventional president. At least he, he behaves in ways that are not typical of the, that were not typical of the, of his predecessors. In regard to Russia, he began by making statements that I thought were exceptionally uh, inappropriate, and by choosing foreign policy advisors who made statements that even by the given the relatively low bar in these matters uh, were uh, naive and and harmful. In February uh, 2017, President Trump, uh, when asked about killings in Russia, uh, political killings, said, well, we kill people too. Now, to, no, no American president had, had ever gone that far in, in justifying political crimes. No, but in Trump's defense, it has to be said that he didn't repeat that mistake, that the early advisors were eliminated, and that despite the fact that he's unnecessarily effusive 
in his attitude toward Putin. His decisions and his actions have been generally quite prudent. Trump has provided defensive weapons to Ukraine. He, of course, retaliated against a chemical weapons attack in Syria. He retaliated against violations of demarcation agreements by Russian-backed mercenaries. Uh, he uh, has demanded that NATO increase their, their spending, NATO countries, and in that way made NATO stronger. He's redeployed many of our forces to, to the east where they're needed. Uh, and he's retaliated in, you know, appropriately to events like the poisoning of the Skripals in the United Kingdom. Even though the fact that, excuse me, even though the fact that they took, shall we go back there? I mean, or he's, he's, he's retaliated appropriately uh, in the face of, a, of events like the poisoning of the Skripals, even though they took place not on American soil, but in the United Kingdom. In other words, he recognized that this kind of lawlessness affects everyone. So uh, in a second term, if he has one, and whoever is our president next year, uh, it will be important uh, to drop uh, the friendly rhetoric, which in fact gets us nowhere. There's not, the Russians do not do anything on the basis of that, that they would that they would not have done otherwise, uh, and it diminishes the ability of the United States to exert influence in the world. It's self-defeating, even though American presidents, who are often quite naive, may not realize that. Uh, these the people who have have taken power in Russia are dedicated to their own survival. They're dedicated, uh, and, that's, and, and that takes precedence over, the, the, over anything else, over human life, over the welfare of the country, over the welfare of the world. Uh, and you can't talk them out of it, you can't charm them out of it, and that's something that every American president needs to realize. That at the same time, Russia is an immensely powerful and deeply cultured country that needs to be part of the West, both for our sake and for the sake of the people who live there. And we can have a role in that uh, through the simple exertion of moral influence. Uh, and that means, you know, speaking out on uh, in the case of events that, that are important. Uh, if there is a crisis of power in Russia, we should bear in mind the example of the 1991 August coup. Uh, the Geke Chepe, the, those were the coup plotters. They had the ability to drown the opposition in blood, just as happened in Tianjin, Tianjin Square in China. They didn't do it. The reason they didn't do it was because in 1991, the ideology had lost its force. Four years of glasnost had so discredited the ideology that it could no longer motivate people to kill. Uh, there's no ideology in Russia now comparable to what existed in the Soviet Union, but there is nationalist feeling. And there is the delusion that the, the rulers of Russia are on the side of the people. The truth about what happened in Russia, including, first of all, the truth about the apartment bombings, is important in, in order to disarm the Russian regime in the face of a future confrontation, if it, if it takes place, or, prob or more appropriately, when it takes place. Uh, and that's why the foreign policy of the United States dealing with Russia should be based on fundamental principles, readiness to, to enunciate this, those principles, the absence of any desire uh, to be quote unquote friends with the Russian leaders who are not worthy of any friendship, and an awareness that our internal conflicts in this country 
are simply not that important compared to the stakes in the broader world. Under those circumstances, uh, we can feel reasonably assured that the challenges that, are, that await us, and there will be challenges, uh, will be challenges that we can handle for our good and for their good as well. You mentioned at some length Ukraine. Could you talk a little about Belarus and the situation developing there now? And whether <clears throat> Putin uh, is sufficiently concerned that he would move militarily there? Well, uh, there's a danger of that. One of the, um, and here again, I, this is why we should never underestimate in our dealings with Russia the importance of deterrence. And but deterrence always has an important psychological element. You're, the, the, Russian, the Russian authorities are interested in understanding the character of the person with whom they're dealing. Uh, how is he likely to respond? They do various types of psychological profiles, uh, but they are also informed by experience. How will a person react? That was why when President, President Obama hesitated uh, to respond to the chemical weapons use in Syria, it reverberated throughout Eastern Europe and throughout the, 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 the former Soviet bloc because it suggested that in the case of aggression directed against them, he would be similarly irresolute. And um, the, uh, the present situation in, in Belarus differs from the situation in, in Ukraine. In Ukraine, there was a large Russian-speaking, pro-Russian element. Crimea itself is a majority ethnic Russian. Uh, um, whereas Belarus is relatively uh, homogeneous. There's no uh, uh, obvious group of collaborators in the case of a Russian invasion. And once again, the calculus becomes uh, how advantageous would it be to the power structure in Russia to become involved in fighting in Belarus uh, that might not prove controllable? Uh, and how serious would be the reaction of the outside world? One of the things that, 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 that um, the late Boris Nemtsov and I tried to explain to a person who became an advisor to President Obama was that uh, the the appearance and 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 the the impression of commitment to principle can in critical situations can have a very very important deterrent effect and uh, one of the factors that's being weighed in Russia right now is the capacity of, of uh, Donald Trump, if he's president, or whoever may succeed him, may or may not succeed him, depending on the results of the election. What, to what degree would they react and what would they be likely to do? Uh, I think under the present circumstances, uh, the Putin regime is, is, is hoping that, that Lukashenko can hold on to power uh, without them. And uh, that, may, prove, that may, may or may not prove to be true. If, if he's overthrown, uh, the, the decision over whether, or if he's on the verge of being overthrown, the decision on whether or not to intervene will be greatly influenced by their perception of our determination uh, not to let it happen or to react to it 
forcefully if it does. Uh, another issue, David, uh, the reaction in Europe to the poisoning with the Novichok nerve agent of uh, opposition leader Navalny mm -hmm. uh, is quite interesting. Uh, that the Europeans and the Germans are indicating that they they will stand uh, together against this behavior they assume by Putin since it was a military grade nerve agent. Oh, might this throw in doubt the continuation of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which Germany is relying on for as a major supply of natural gas and on which Putin is relying because it's a huge source of income for his regime? What, what, what do you think might happen there? Would the Europeans actually be tough enough to do something like this? We'll see. We'll see. They might be. I mean, he's his... Putin's behavior is very provocative. Uh, you know, the, the, the Europeans took part in the sanctions that were imposed after the poisoning of the Skripals. And if he's using exactly the same poison or a poison that's related to it to murder or attempt to murder uh, 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 an anti-corruption fighter in, in Russia, who's probably the most prominent opposition leader at the moment, uh, that indicates that previous sanctions didn't work. They didn't have any effect. So the question is, uh, is it really sensible to, to, to repeat sanctions on the same level uh, as those that were ineffective in the past? Or does it make sense to escalate? And I think that any a logical person, and, and President Trump has in fact urged this, would, would understand that under these circumstances, continuation of the Nord Stream project is, 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 is uh, not, a, not advisable for anyone, not for, for any of the Western parties. Uh, on another issue, you mentioned that um, the, the Soviet ideology is no longer operative in Russia. Uh, and you indicated that nationalism is a part of a replacement it's an attempted replacement. Attempted replacement. You also mentioned the word transcendent several times, the lack of a transcendence. Um, certain people think that there, there's a Russia, uh, there, there's a religious revival in Russia, that the Russian Orthodox Church is um, gaining in strength. You know, the hierarchy of that church was so seriously compromised in the Soviet regime. Uh, do you think there is a genuine religious recovery in Russia? And of course, Putin tries to portray himself as a believer and attends some Orthodox yeah. services. Is that just a charade? Yes, just a charade. Just to charade the people. I mean, and the people they buy the costume, the the cassocks and the uh, and the paraphernalia. They they love they love to appear on religious festivals. Uh, there's nothing religious about them. Uh, as for a religious re revival in the country, people have been saying that for decades. Uh, I think it's pretty superficial if it exists at all. The, what what you have in Russia is that that the, the village priests, the local priests, they do a lot of good in comforting people and giving people some support. But the hierarchy's rotten of the church. Uh, and uh, you know, the church is a national symbol. It, 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 but but it's manipulated by the authorities and those 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 observances that you note and 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 Putin's attempt to depict himself as uh, deeply religious you know largely for the benefit for the benefit of the West uh, it, it's 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 all false it's all false I mean how can 
the church has not spoken out against corruption. Just to give you an example, uh, the, the, the church received under Yeltsin special privileges to import uh, tax-free, duty-free cigarettes and alcohol, although smoking in the Orthodox Church is considered a sin. They made huge fortunes on that. The hierarchs did. And uh, there was a, f uh, a photo was taken of the, of, uh, the present patriarch wearing a, a very, very expensive watch, you know, worth tens of thousands of dollars. And in the official photograph, they, they, they removed the watch because it had been noticed. But they forgot that the reflection of the watch was still present in, in the polished table. So, you know, in, in, I would not attach a great deal of importance to the so-called religious revival in Russia. And people in the West who are particularly American conservatives should be aware there's nothing religious, for example, about ordering troops to open fire on women and children uh, ha who are hundreds of hostages and to open fire on them with, for example, flamethrowers and grenade launchers as if this is a military object. And there's no, nothing religious about blowing people up in the middle of the night the, 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 um, in, in order to seize power. It's, um, you know, they, the Russians are aware that Americans really are, are, are in many ways very parochial and, and don't understand that, that uh, there are places with, where the mentality is very different. Russia, uh, according to some accounts, has an economy smaller than Italy's. Yet it has developed uh, a first-class military in terms of modern weapons. And of course, it has used some of them in the Middle East. Um, it's supplying weapons in Libya. You seem to indicate that Putin really doesn't have any geopolitical strategy. Uh, if not, he's got to be one of the first class and most effective opportunists in terms of foreign policy in, in uh, gaining uh, presence in the Mediterranean. Uh, I don't know, perhaps in his alliance with China, we'll see about that one. But he, he certainly seems to be successful in creating the image of having a geopolitical strategy. They do want to create that image, you're right. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the strategy is not what the outside world thinks it is. The strategy is to keep themselves in power. Uh, they understand that certainly the impression given to the Russian people that Russia is, you know, once again, a great power uh, will, uh, will, will work to their benefit. Russia, Russia has an imperial mentality. It's had it traditionally. But that doesn't mean that they, I mean, and if you stop to think of it, what, what really could be their geopolitical strategy? What is it that they're trying? What would they be trying to achieve? I mean, the, the Soviet Union had a geopolitical strategy. They wanted to spread communism all over the world. They wanted to save humanity. From the from 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 the oppression of capitalism and create a a, 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 a a world in which there was no war, no class conflict, everyone was guaranteed a job, and so on. So that was their geopolitical strategy. What, you know, according to the ideology, but no ideology in Russia. So what is it? That, what's their geopolitical strategy? Uh, to 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 defend themselves while no one's attacking them. To uh, 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 dominate the Middle East for what reason? Uh, you know, why is that in their interest and why is it necessary to them? Uh, you know, what do they gain from that? Uh, on the contrary, because of the, their actions, they may create the kind of uh, extremism and encourage the kind of extremism that might rebound eventually against Russian civilians as, as well as everybody else although they have little concern for Russian civilians. And we should just, you know, we don't want to think in cliches. Uh, you know, Russia does have a concrete interest. I mean, or the, the, the government of Russia has a 
has an interest which it pursues, it pers and that is making sure that those who are in power stay in power. That's that's their geopolitical strategy. Of course, the um, uh, multiplication of weapons and and so on uh, goes on, but that that plays into the traditional mentality of the country and its desire to make people afraid. I mean, this be there were there. Nicholas I, in the beginning of the 19th century, said that Russia should make people afraid. It's not something new. Yeah, what about uh, their objectives in respect to China? Uh, I would think that any long-term thinker on geopolitical issues would be extremely worried as a Russian about the burgeoning power of China. They what should be, they should be, and they should see the West as their natural ally. You think? Uh, and they should, they should be worried about the power of Iran. Not, not that they, because of, because of the crimes of which the Iranians are capable. They should be worried a lot of, about a lot of things. And they would be if they were thinking in terms of the welfare of their own population. But they're not. Because what's good for the population is not necessarily good for those who rule the population. They, you know, friendship with the United States and close cooperation with the U.S. makes sense for Russia as a country. It makes no sense whatsoever for uh, a, a small group that has taken power in Russia and rules by, as, and was able to do so with, as a result of acts of terror. Uh, that's, that, that's the point. For them, uh, Western institutions, Western demands for due process, I mean, you know, the last thing they need is a system in which they can't go and kill their opponents. Uh, they can kill anyone now, and nobody, you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to squeak inside Russia, uh, and they don't want to have to be under pressure from the West. Uh, we saw what happened with Boris Nemtsov, my personal friend, by the way. Uh, David, let me close with asking you a question about the effect of the coronavirus in Russia, mm -hmm. and the claim of the regime that it's now developed two vaccines. Is that also a charade? I, I mean, that's well, a, in the case, the I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll find out that they're capable of developing vaccines. Russia has many, many, many talented people. And during the you know Soviet period, any, and even afterwards, they had an active program in a research program in virology, and they developed uh, many uh, bacteriological weapons, by the way, uh, in violation of treaties with the U.S. Uh, so it's not out of the question that they came up with something. What is the question is whether that's been adequately uh, tested and whether there's a risk from the Russian vaccine. Because one thing we can be sure of is that they would not be overly concerned about you know, the possible adverse effects on the population if they thought they could get some propaganda benefit, benefit from this. Well, actually, let me ask one more question. What ought the United States be most worried about in respect to Russia? The most worrying uh, possibility is that there will be inst internal instability and that it could become uncontrollable because the regime is not fundamentally stable. I mean, if we, deter if we define stability, not as surface calm, but rather as the ability to absorb and handle unexpected internal and external shocks, then Russia is not stable. Russia, uh, the, the president, uh, regime does have seem at the moment to have a, a grip on power because the, and they they do it with relatively low low level of violence I must say I mean to give them credit compared to previous Russian regimes they do so with corruption manipulation false information the external threat of course which they need in order to consolidate the population. Uh, but uh, those instruments are unreliable in the long run, and, and, and history shows that nobody can rule forever. We saw what happened to the, the Assads, 
uh, and the challenge that was posed to them, to Gaddafi. We saw what happened to Ceausescu. We saw what, uh, you know, authoritarian rule, and now the challenge to Lukashenko. Uh, uh, authoritarian rulers and author authoritarian regimes tend to, to degrade and, and, and over time and uh, to become more corrupt, more, more intolerant, less flexible and more lawless and to engender more and more discontent. Uh, the, that, that is the same, Russia is not an exception to that rule. David Satter, thank you very much for joining us today at the Westminster Institute. We greatly appreciate your insights into Russia. Uh, I invite our audience to not only share the video of this lecture, but to go to the Westminster Institute website where you will see uh, the library of videos from our past lectures on subjects such as China, the Middle East, Islam, and, and other things of concern to the United States and the West. Thank you for joining us.